Hi, welcome to Storytelling Animals, a green new podcast of climate, ecology, and animal justice where we use books to help make sense of the ecological crisis. My guest today I'm very excited about is Kim Stanley Robinson. He's a science fiction writer, the author of about 20 novels, um, most famously perhaps the Mars Trilogy. Uh, He's also written a number of novels that engage with climate change, most recently The Ministry for the Future. Uh, and he also just wrote a nonfiction book, um, release date May 10th, uh, called The High Sierra, A Love Story. The High Sierra refers to a portion of the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California where Stan, as he goes by, has spent a lot of time backpacking over the last uh, many decades. The book covers how he first fell in love with the mountain range. It recounts some of uh, his most memorable trips there, some of his favorite parts. Um, he goes into the geology of the reason, region, the history, um, the native peoples, uh, the origins of the Sierra Club, which emerged to enjoy and protect this region of the world. And there are also uh, lots of lovely photos of him and his friends out hiking. It's an area of the world that I am very fond of as well, born and raised in Southern California myself. And I'm also very fond of Kim Stanley Robinson's novels. I've read 10 of them. Uh, They're some of my favorite books I've read. And I am going to ask some of you to join me in reading uh, The Ministry for the Future for the Storytelling Animals Book Club. We have a monthly book club as part of this podcast. And uh, in two months, so Tuesday, July 26th, we will be discussing Ministry for the Future. Our May book club on the 31st will be discussing N.K. Jemisin's The Fifth Season, Um, and in June, the last Tuesday of the month, we will be discussing Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which is a nonfiction book about fungi that I'm quite excited about. If you wish to join uh, one of these meetings, uh, you can join my free weekly newsletter. Uh, The link is in the episode description, Um, and that will keep you posted about when they are. If you wish to join all three or some of them moving forward, um, you can support this podcast on Patreon at the Lorax tier or above uh, to join the book club moving forward. Again, if you want to just try out one as a a trial of sorts, uh, just join the newsletter, which is free. If you want to join more than one, um, please support this podcast on Patreon. And even if you aren't interested in the book club, please consider supporting this podcast on Patreon. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much to those of you who already support the podcast and you get, uh, early access to episodes and other perks depending on, um, what level you subscribe at. So let's get to the interview. We, we cover, um, a lot about his book, The High Sierra. Uh, he talks about some of his experience hiking. Um, we talk about how it influenced his fiction. Uh, we talk about the Mars novels and Antarctica in particular, And then we get into other stuff like rewriting the Constitution, uh, how we can best protect wild species, the legacy of John Muir, and at the end he shares his tips for first-time backpackers in the Sierra uh, where you might want to go. All right, without further ado, here's the interview. Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, Stan, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure, Dayton. It's good to be with you. Um, yeah, so your new book that just came out, um, I believe it's your first uh, nonfiction book, full length, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and it's called The High Sierra, A Love Story. Um, maybe we could just start with uh, the the meat cute of that love story. Uh, how did you first fall in love with the Sierra Nevada mountain range? I was an undergraduate at UC San Diego. I had been a beach kid all my life, uh, growing up in Southern California and going to the beaches. And I'd had some Boy Scout experiences that um, had incorrectly convinced me that I wasn't interested in the mountains. It was partly because of Boy Scouts and partly because of the mountains that we went to being the San Jacintos in Southern California. And so when I was a summer after my junior year of college, I went with a couple of my best friends who I had been friends with since sixth grade, and we were going to college together. And we went up to the Desolation Wilderness, 
uh, near Lake Tahoe, southwest corner of Lake Tahoe, and took off from there. And I was interested, but completely ignorant of what the experience was going to be like. We were young hippies, long-haired stoner, uh, anti-Vietnam. We had low draft numbers. We were um, kind of stereotypes of early 1970s wildness. And as part of that stereotype, we were, uh, in those days, experimenting with taking LSD. So uh, we dropped acid about 100 yards up the trail from Emerald Bay there at Lake Tahoe and uh, spent the rest of that day headed westward towards the Crystal Range, which is a sweet granite range uh, running down about the middle of Desolation Wilderness, north to south. Uh, it was a big day. Everything was new blew my mind and um, did not get any sleep that night, just lying there by a stream watching it chuckle on by and thinking things over. And it was like a um, conversion experience, like a road to Damascus experience. I mean, I have made jokes. I make it in the book, said it often. Then I got, I got high that day and I have never come down since, since that day. Uh, I've been on a permanent Sierra high since that day in August of 1973, and there is some truth to that, I have to say. I, I've i never lost the feeling that when I'm up there, I am walking around in a miracle, and that I'm filled with some kind of a significant joy. And now there have been awkward times, um, difficult times, uh, various kinds of uh, struggles with other people or with the mountain itself, but by and large, that that strong first day feeling has persisted my whole life. So it's now been um, very close to 50 years. I guess next summer will be the 50th anniversary of that trip. Yeah, I I actually grew up in Southern California, but my grandpa has lived in uh, Mammoth Lakes uh, my whole life. And so we'd go up and visit him and hike either in Mammoth or another Sierra trails around, around there. Um, and kind of wasn't until I, I went off to college that I kind of realized, oh, there aren't other places like this um, elsewhere in the world. And forever I've been since, I don't think there's better hiking than places I've been in the Sierra. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think about nature might or the wilderness or uh, whatever might first think of like a dense forest or jungle somewhere near the equator, uh, bursting with different species and high levels of biodiversity. Uh, you mention uh, in the book that you have friends who who maybe are a little dismissive of the Sierra Nevada because uh, it has relatively few animals and they, they might prefer marsh ecosystems, for instance. Um, so what's the case for somewhere like the Sierra? Good question. Um, it's easier to walk around on the High Sierra, by and large, than it is in jungles or marshes. Um, and you, if you, you have to like rock. So really, the Sierras are a mass of exposed granite and some metamorphic rock laid on it here and there. But by and large, it's a gigantic stretch of exposed granite. Now, some people regard that as um, lifeless, severe, um, unfriendly, and ominous. And in historical time, humans didn't get fond of mountains and regard them as sublime places. They were just seen as wastelands for most of the centuries of humankind. So it's a, it's the aesthetic response to bare rock is um, a late development and maybe a little peculiar and maybe not everybody shares it. I, I wouldn't make a universal claim for it. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me as gorgeous and I've gotten very fond of it. I'm pretty familiar with it now. From from where your was it your grandfather, did you say, in yeah. Mammoth? Uh -huh. Yeah. From Mammoth down to just below um, Mount Whitney, so Lone Pine on 395, that stretch of the Sierras is the one that I know. I'm not well familiar with Yosemite, which is more famous, and which I've visited, of course, but I'm not spent anywhere near as much time there as I have in what people call either the Southern Sierras or they call it the High Sierra, uh, because it is quite high, a little bit higher than Yosemite itself. So that's my territory, and I 
I would say that despite this massive long book that I've written, I have not managed to explain the attraction even to my own satisfaction. So um, in that sense, it was a peculiar experiment in can I find this feeling by writing it uh, from every angle I could think of? And no, I, I couldn't quite find the feeling. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't explain it, but I'd love it. Uh-huh. And it really is every angle one could think of from you get into the geology of the region, uh, what you call the psychogeology, the, the history of the indigenous peoples and the sort of John Muir era explorers and early Sierra Club. Uh, you talk about a lot of your own trips. Um, it is, I think, an impressive wealth of uh, different ways in to try to explore how this place um, stole your heart. Yes, well, it's true, and thank you for that. I, I'm weak on certain aspects that I can't remember, like names of flowers or even names of trees, which you would think would stick with you because there aren't that many kinds of trees up there. But um, I have an incapacity there, and I, I like to look at them without always knowing exactly what I'm looking at. But the things that I do remember and have studied, the the rock forms, um, the animals, which are simple because there aren't very many uh, species up there, uh, and of course my own experiences with with weather and with route finding, the kind of um, what you might call gymnastics of cross-country travel, um, that's something to talk about, I think, and that uh, one thing I wanted to do with this book, very much so, was to uh, write against the idea of mountains as being place for climbers, where you go up there, hang off of vertical faces, and often die. So that mountains were connected with kind of a macho, um, and, and clinging by the edge of your fingertips, and, and you might die, but it's such a glorious thing to be climbing a mountain. Well, I feel none of that. Um, if it's steeper than a staircase, I get really uncomfortable. Uh, the Sierra Club has graded the slopes in the Sierras classes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then 5 is vertical and is divided from 5.1 up to about 5.14 for technical climbers to rate the difficulties of the of the uh, cliff that they're going up. For us, class 2 was the golden zone, where you have to use your hands occasionally to help yourself up or to keep your balance where if you were to fall, you might sprain an ankle at the worst. And where it really, a staircase is a good thing to think of because they're semi-approximately 45 degrees. And I'm not even sure that's true. The The treads might be wider than the lifts are tall. Um, but anything steeper than about 40 degrees is actually uh, quite frightening. And at that point, they call it class three. And my friends and I have been on class three from time to time, but it's kind of uh, traumatic. Uh, we do it because we have to, to get somewhere where we really have to go. And we usually are on our crawling on our bellies and, and just quivering with fear. And this is on class three. And there's also class four and five where ropes are uh, recommended, but not always used, of course, as has famously been shown by these free solo people. So um, what I wanted to write about was walking and scrambling and doing something that is much less fraught with, um, with danger and with, I don't know, charismatic, uh, devil-may-care machismo. That's just not our style. You do get into some scraps in the book uh, that, at least reading them, sound frightening. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to, I think... I forget if it's you or you quoting Muir call, called it a gentle wilderness. Yes. Muir said that, and that's a great name, that it's wilderness, but it is gentle. And especially compared to other mountain ranges of the world, uh, when I was younger, I was interested in other mountain ranges as a compare contrast to the Sierras. And I kept trying to backpack in other mountain ranges, which has never worked very well. So if the Sierras are are a gentle wilderness and the other range I know best, the Swiss Alps are savage civilization because they can definitely kill you uh, within a half hour going from from uh, alpine flowers to wicked, uh, dangerous storms. 
and uh, the Sierras, of course, can storm on you also, but you you get warning. You have usually your shelter on your back in your backpack, and um, it's, a, it's a kind of a game that we play up there. I, I, I definitely don't want to make claims for it that are um, somehow overreaching, like, like we're doing something uh, uh, special. It is... Uh, interesting beautiful fun but it isn't it isn't transcendent and i mean it has its transcendent moments if you if you uh are lucky and it feels to you like you're in a sacred space then of course there's a kind of a transcendence but it isn't like what people are thinking of when they think of mountain climbing mm -hmm. so you mention uh in the book that you've gained more appreciation over the years for um, the different animals that you cite in the Sierra. Um, can you talk about maybe why that is? Yes, and and thank you for that, because it's important. Um, I was relatively clueless and uncaring about the few animals that we would see when we were up there. And the common neighbors, as I call them, are deer, as you see everywhere in the Americas, and marmots, a rather uncommon local species, but all over in the Sierra. Occasionally some bear um, and pikas, so the tiny little um, creatures that are look at first like mice, but they're closer related to rabbits. So, okay, all that was of minimal interest to me. I really was a rock guy and a scrambler and, and um, looking at it as if it was works of art that didn't include fellow creatures. But as I've aged, I've realized a couple of things, that we are in a mass extinction event. We're starting... An, um, the sixth great mass extinction event in Earth's history, and wild creatures are rare on this planet, that 97% of the meat on the planet is human beings and their domestic beasts, and all the rest of the wild creatures only comprise 3% of the biomass on the planet. So it's a crisis. It's ugly because it's going to be a squeaker whether we dodge the mass extinction event. We're going to have to take care of biodiversity in a way that we're not yet. Luckily, it's now a topic. It's on the radar of civilization, of people who are basically urban and and uh, uninterested in animals. Don't uh, Zoos look like jails, and they don't see wild animals in daily life. Uh, pets take their place, and pets are very important in that regard. But uh, to see a wild animal now, for me, is something rather stirring and important as an experience because humans in the paleolithic period of course were living with animals as one animal among the rest some you would try to eat some would try to eat you they were a constant presence and you had a sense of their characters and the paleolithic art makes that very very clear so in 2008 um, some national park rangers who were hosting a group of artists and writers and i was one of them they took us to see a, a small herd of sierra nevada bighorn sheep and this was extraordinary experience for me because I knew that they were up there, but I did not expect ever to see them. At one point, there was only 100 individuals left. They were put on the endangered species list. The federal government started scientists and workers to um, track them, care for them, spread, split them off into herds and put them in places where they used to live and weren't now. They're up to about... 700 individuals now from a low point in the i'm not sure when it was perhaps even the early 90s so it's a big success story and i was looking at a herd of about 30 of them um, across a meadow including young kids that were gamboling around in the meadow and trying to um, bang on their mom and get a drink and and fooling around and spring balking up into the air and falling over in heaps and acting like kids do and I, that was another um conversion experience or a moment uh where i was my mind was blown the beauty of them the reality of them the endangered aspect of them that i was seeing 10 percent of an entire species right there in a meadow Jeez. um it was uh it changed me, and I began to become more attentive. And now, even when you see the deer, who are really widespread, and they have uh, some predators up there, mountain lions and coyotes, 
but by and large they don't have as many predators as they ought, so they crash under their own population pressures. This is true all across North America. So even seeing them is quite a beautiful experience because they're getting by without any help from us. They're they're living their lives. They're calm. Because this is usually in national parks where no hunting is allowed, they're not fearful of humans. They will stand in a meadow with you and eat their grass and look at you and not regard you as anything other than, you know, those backpacker people are peculiar. But they're not a danger. So... Um, this has become quite a beautiful part of my backpacking life, and every once in a while will be... It's a completely different feeling when you run into a bear. You always feel a mild sense of, oh my God, this guy could kill me for sure. Mm -hmm. Fast, strong, um, obviously nearly blind. Um, but they seem calm most of the time. When we see them, they're uninterested in us, or maybe... They're going to track us in order to try to steal our food at night, um, or they're embarrassed to be seen because they don't really like to be seen by humans. Bears have a different vibe for sure than deer. But it's always beautiful to see wild animals. And I've seen a few rare ones up there that are they're nocturnal or they're small or they're really not very numerous. So uh, pine martens, fishers. Uh, coyotes, which are common in America, but not in the High Sierra. And these these two, these experiences are... I also saw a Sierra Fox once. That was. Nice. These are mostly one-offs. I see them once, and it's in an entire lifetime of backpacking. Uh -huh. But it's special. Yeah. You say in the book, and I'm going to briefly quote here, uh, if our purpose as a civilization were to shift to keeping all the species, our fellow citizens alive to making space for them and even helping them if they need help, which means helping them recover from the damage we've done to them, then maybe we could do it. But it would have to be our purpose. And I was really struck by this idea that it would have to be our purpose. Um, I was wondering if you had thoughts or would be able to expand on what, what that would look like. I can because something has happened that I am um, really surprised to see and really pleased about, it's one of the most hopeful things that I can talk about these days, is that the E.O. Wilson plan called that he called Half Earth, that we leave half of the Earth's surface to the wild creatures mm -hmm. and concentrate ourselves on just half of the Earth's surface, that's coming to fruition as an actual legislated governmental and human civilizational plan. In other words, we are agreeing to do it. It's usually called 30 by 30. 30% 30 of the land surface conserved, preserved, kept wild in various kinds of land management uh, designations that don't always equate to pure wilderness, but n nobody should be interested in purity at this point. Um, what it would mean is leaving them alone um, and letting them live their lives. 30% of the land surface, California has this as a state program, uh, the Biden administration for it. Sometimes it gets rewilding. In any case, these 30 by 30 plans are are now real. Uh, money's being spent on them. Laws are being passed. Land is being categorized. And changes in land practices are sometimes following. Uh, the initial effort has been often just definitional. Okay, this kind of land is preserved for animals. We already did that. That's called a national forest or a wilderness area. Um, other areas include some kinds of grazing of cattle, but the, since the tule elk are gone, the uh, cattle, if they're uh, ranched correctly, could replace what the tule elk used to do on the land. And so... Um, the 30 by 30 plan is flexible, at least in California, and is trying to make sure that it doesn't exile people or regard people as an invariable problem, that there are ways of coexisting on the land that allow some human presence that would nevertheless uh, keep the bulk of the activities for wild creatures. And so that that all is really happening means that this vision that the purpose of civilization is to dodge a mass extinction event and keep our fellow creatures alive 
that's becoming part of the project. It's Biodiversity is often now being keyed as a problem just as serious as climate change, and the two problems are often uh, combined into one polycrisis, and it, it doesn't do any good to turn down the thermostat if you've killed off all the other creatures on Earth. And um, you can't save all the creatures on Earth without turning the thermostat down a little bit and, and stop burning carbon into the atmosphere. So the two problems are interlinked. And as we try to uh, deal with one, we're dealing with the other. And what I find reassuring is that this isn't seen as a an aesthetic response of a middle-class suburban backpacker or someone who is prosperous enough to be able to worry about other things than their own um, daily food and shelter. It's seen as a civilizational necessity to keep people healthy too. And I'm I'm heartened by this. It's a it's a sign that uh, ecological understanding is becoming widespread and legislated, and we need it bad. We're we're close to too late, but we're not too late. So mm -hmm. good things are happening. So I'm uh, I've been reading your novel Antarctica, um, and it's making me reflect about what you said about being attracted to landscape that is that is rocky, or I guess in this case icy, but that's would some would consider bare. Um, and I guess you could say about that about whether it's the glaciers of near the South Pole or, um, you know, Mars before it's terraformed and your Mars trilogy is this landscape that is devoid of life, but that you nonetheless um, kind of describe in these loving and beautiful terms. Um, how do you think about the the landscape um, in your in your fiction? Like in, in what way does the setting and landscape play a role in the work um, as a character and even an actor in the story? It's a good question. And it's been really important to me. It is a kind of an instinct. Um, and I was talking with someone else about Ursula Le Guin just, uh, just this morning, how she used to say, you don't really choose your stories, your stories choose you. And if you're smart, you will stay open to the stories that seem to impose themselves on you. And because I, uh, a, a confluence of things hit me when I was young. Science fiction itself, I came to as an undergraduate, not as a child. So science fiction, Buddhism, and I was doing Zen Buddhism in a typical California hippie way, casual but but not trivial. It was important to me. Uh, Ram Dass, D.T. Suzuki, Gary Snyder, very much so. And so science fiction, Buddhism, and the Sierra Nevada, all at once, in a kind of triple strand where they seem to illuminate each other and be part of the same project. Now, the oddity there is perhaps science fiction. But science fiction, I, what I loved in science fiction was precisely Le Guin and Jack Vance and Edgar Pangborn and what uh, some people call the planetary romance, where you would be, at this point in, in science fiction history from, say, the 30s through the 50s, one strand of it would be zipping around the galaxy and visiting other planets and they would be exotic. They would be sandy like dune, or they would be icy like winter in left-handed darkness, or they would be jungly, as in Zelazny, or they would be various, like real planets are various, and um, the humans would visit them and be um, bewitched. The, there would be an entrancing romantic quality. It was romantic to cross an alien planet, and there would be perhaps alien animals on it, but in any case, distant landscapes, and you would have to struggle. It was only one strand of science fiction, which by and large was mostly urban. You were inside spaceships or super cities, but there was that planetary aspect of it that I personally loved a lot. And because of my Sierra experiences, I was thinking, I can bring my life experiences into science fiction and add something that urban science fiction doesn't have. And the, I will avoid what I called the cardboard set problem, which was the early Star Treks on TV. You could tell that the bridge of the Starship Enterprise was like partly made of cardboard, and, uh -huh. and science fiction movies would have cardboard sets. 
But if you had rock and you were on a real planet, then the sets would be solidified and you would have something interesting to add to science fiction. And this is why I came to Mars. So um, it was a reverse engineering. Or, or I was entranced by Mars when the Viking data came to us because it looked like the American West. It looked like it would be a great place to go backpacking. Well, the more you learn about Mars, the more you realize that's actually a deceptive the look of the place disguises the fact that it's poisonous, that it has almost no atmosphere and will kill you instantly. So then you have to terraform it in order to make it a good space to go backpacking in. So I told the story of the terraforming of Mars partly because I had an interest in writing about it as a place to walk on that would be new and exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed the learning that some of your descriptions of Mars after terraforming were just kind of taken from descriptions of the Sierra Nevada. Yep, that's true. And I went to Antarctica because I wrote the Mars books and everybody, while I was researching Mars, said, well, the best Earth analog for Mars would be the dry valleys of Antarctica. And I thought, well, I'd love to see that. And I actually applied to go to Antarctica with the NSF in order to write Blue Mars. And they wrote back to me and said, no, you can't. We only let artists down there to write about Antarctica or do photography. We're not interested in analogies. We're not interested in giving you a better idea of what Mars is like. We are very utilitarian here at the U.S. Antarctic Program, which they are, and very literal-minded uh, scientists. And so I wrote back to them the following year and said, okay, I'll write a science fiction novel set in Antarctica. And at that point, my letters of recommendation were from Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> <laughs> I've lost those letters, which um, oh. it's my bad. I put them in such a safe space that I can't find them anymore. <laughs> um, but um, So they accepted me in the program, and I had no idea what I was going to write. So that novel, Antarctica, that you said you were reading, which I had a great time writing, it came to me as I was cross-country skiing back and forth on the Shackleton Glacier's uh, landing strip. Because they had bulldozed the glacier to be sure there were no crevasses, when you left the campsite, you were ordered to stay on the landing strip rather than going off on the glacier on your own so you didn't fall down a crevasse and die while everybody else was asleep. So it was midnight and I was on cross-country skis, and I'm, I'm not a good skier, but it was flat as a table, and I was skiing back and forth. Then the, the landing strip for these C-130s was either one mile long or two mile long, but in any case, it was really long. And But I had nothing else to do, and I was kind of wide awake. I was skiing back and forth. Of course, it never gets dark, so the sun was just as overhead as it was at noon, um, just in a different spot in the sky. And the whole plot, came to me in a couple of laps on the Shackleton Glacier. And I was really happy because up to that point, I didn't know what story I was going to tell. Uh -huh. So it was beautiful. It's a, It's been a fun one so far. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, especially having read a bunch of your novels before I read the High Sierra book, um, it's very clear how your time in the mountains has bled over into a lot of your fiction um, from the, you know, most recently, there's a scene in the Alps in Ministry for the Future. Um, one of your earliest books, The Gold Coast, actually has uh, sort of one of my favorite mountain scenes is the main character is, <laughs> you know, every it's this like fast paced, frenetic dystopia and everything in the book is so going so fast and stressful in a lot of ways. And he's trying to figure out his life and on the run from the cops. And then his friend takes him up to the Sierra Nevada and they go backpacking and just the whole pace of the novel changes the whole, you know, his whole view on life and perspective. Um, and it's, I think, re really easy to see that reading that, that, oh, you're someone who likes hiking in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and I was, I think, appreciated, especially as someone who has also been there that I could picture it. Um, yeah. I think what is interesting in the book in the high sierra book is that you know there's all these places where the sierras bleed into your fiction writing there wasn't a lot at least in the book where the fiction writing comes into your time in the sierras like there aren't scenes of you 
writing or reading on your hikes or, or brainstorming. Um, you're kind of just out there to hike. Uh, is that, are there, is that accurate or, or are there ways in which um, kind of they work together? Well, um, I used to take a little lab notebook with me in my backpack and now I just write on the back of the maps. I take a pen for sure and I'll write down notes. Uh, when I was writing Shaman, I went on a winter backpack game trip by myself uh, um, in order to take notes and see if I could get some direct perceptions from winter backpacking right into Shaman. And for sure, when I was writing the Mars Trilogy, I was doing a lot of backpacking where when as I was hiking the trail, uh, working out macro plot like what what happens in this novel and i had time to think and you know the peripatetics aristotle and plato they they thought that walking was important and an aid to thinking that there was something pedestrian about thought and as you were walking your thoughts would be clearer um, and they felt that as a physical slash mental reality and i don't know but for sure you have a lot of time to, when you're just walking, especially if you're on trail trudging along, there's a lot of time without distractions of, um, you know, I got to do something at four, I got to do something at six. You're just going to be walking all day long. So you have time for your brain to settle in and, and follow a train of thought for a while. So I did a lot of plotting in the mountains and I, and I did a little bit of writing. Um, I, I wrote some poems up there because I, I began as a poet but I was never particularly good at it, and I've I've persisted with it my entire life. Uh, but it's obvious to me that I'm a prose writer and a novelist, and with an interest in poetry that's a, a hobby like anybody else's hobby. Um, so I would do all that in the mountains, and then I always was looking for excuses to write scenes in the mountains, but they don't come that often. I'm glad you mentioned the Gold Coast for a couple of reasons. That is really the story of 1973. I mean, Jim Hutchinson, Kim Robinson, there's not much disguise going on there. I don't often write autobiographically based novels. I've done it a couple times in my entire life, but The Gold Coast is one of them. And I think it works. Um, the sense of desperate craziness of youth is semi-dystopia. The story of my parents, and I captured them I recently looked into the Gold Coast, and my parents have been uh, dead now for um, a decade or more. And I'm amazed at a little I, how how I use them as models without um, attempting to make any changes. And in fact, it seemed to me the project was to capture them as perfectly as I could on the page in their lives as heroic characters. I mean, because it was a positive portrait. I didn't hold back, and I caught the way that they talked and uh, little turns of speech. It was really quite a stunning thing to me to look back into the Gold Coast. And then the Tashi character is my friend Terry Bear. It's a pretty great portrait of Terry in those years. Tashi was uh, Terry. Terry was Tashi. Terry read the Gold Coast. He liked the character Tashi. He, he, in fact, he almost named his son Tashi, but uh, his... Um, wife didn't agree. <laughs> so um, I was glad because Tashi is a, also a kind of heroic figure in his quiet way. And it, it is exactly right. I was somewhat flipping out, mainly with the same kind of angst that any other young person ha has. Um, I mean, for, for the most part, I was having fun, but the fun was getting a little bit frantic. And also, what was I going to do when college was over and how was i going to reconcile my various romantic entanglements and the fact that i had no prospects and i didn't uh, i was just doing uh you know bullshit jobs to pay my bills when i wasn't actually in college but college is going to end i was quite confused and things were getting super intense in orange county california it was just a little bit too um bang 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 uh, the intensity was uh, ratcheted up really high in my life at that time. And then suddenly Terry said, look, just come to the Sierras. You're getting too overwrought here. So there's a emotional and psychological truth in the Gold Coast to my own life that is probably more uh, 
articulated than even this High Sierra book, which tells the same story in a much less vivid way. Yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned Terry because he is he's the one who first pulls you into the Sierra and kind of looms as a an important figure in, in the story of all your backpacking in the book. Oh yeah. Um, and then also for those who don't know your, your shaman book, uh, which I have not read yet, but that's set in the ice age, right? Following us. Yes. Um, cool. So uh, one of the games you play in the high Sierra book uh, has to do with names. Uh, you wish to rename a great deal of the range and its features. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us why you decided to include this? Yes, it, there are multiple strands, and um, it's a good topic. So thank you for that. The I I divided the names into the good, the bad, the ugly, and also we had a project uh, about ten years ago that was kind of I. Uh, it was my idea, but it wasn't my idea. I had this perception. We were going by Mount Emerson, and there was a big mountain on the other side of the canyon for Mount Emerson that I said should be called Mount Thoreau. I looked into it, and there wasn't any mountain named Mount Thoreau west of the Mississippi. And I had been reading Thoreau's journals, which are truly superb, um, uh, nature writing, personal writing, autobiography, they're one of the greatest journals ever written, without a doubt. And I was deep into them when I made this announcement. <clears throat> well, it was just that, and it, and it would have passed without any action whatsoever. But I, when I mentioned it to some friends here in Davis, um, one of them, Lori Glover, who taught writing at Davis at the time, said, well, let's do it. And I didn't even comprehend what she meant by that. But what she meant was um, climb the mountain, name it, have a party, write a book about it, um, do a little conference, a kind of a, a Sierra Club type game slash, uh, what would you call it? It's a, it's not, is it a religious action? Um, um, a landscape, a piece of landscape art, like Andy Goldsworthy, to name this peak across from Emerson Thoreau, so that then when you go up this canyon, Pirate Canyon was a Native American route um, uh, used for thousands of years, you cross the crest of the Sierra between these two peaks, and now you're crossing between Emerson and Thoreau, and the, all the transcendentalist love of nature comes into play. It's a, it was a quite a, a beautiful piece of landscape art, which I will say is basically Laurie Glover's doing, but a group of us that included Gary Snyder and about maybe 15 or 20 other people gathered, climbed the mountain, did the deed, and it made me interested. Um, and then I began to look into it, and there was also these issues that are, has come across since then, and so in these last 10 years, um, features of the West that have been named for uh, war criminals or slave owners. So um, Confederate monuments are coming down, um, slurs against Native Americans if there's names on the landscape, um, or against uh, uh, slaves or ex-slaves. Names are being changed. If they are, if they were given in the 19th century or early 20th century in a spirit of racism or, or imperialist ugliness, then that isn't really what we want our landscape features to be doing, reminding us of. So there's a, a good movement. There is now actually a, um, a website and a form and a procedure to petition the U.S. Bureau of Names to get rid of uh, racist and demeaning names in, in, on American landscape. All this has come up really um, recently. There were, uh, I got interested in it before this renaming and removal of offensive names uh, really got momentum. So I'm, I feel a little behind the curve in the sense that I'm surprised by all these things happening. Um, I thought I was playing a game, but a, a lot of people uh, are quite serious about it. So I've had to adjust my sense that I was just fooling around. Like, let me give you an example of fooling around. Mount Whitney is named after Josiah Whitney. Well, he was a, a second-rate um, scientist and a bureaucrat, and 
Not that I have anything against bureaucrats or scientists, but he wasn't very good at it, and he is insulting to John Muir when they were arguing about the origins of Yosemite Valley. Muir was right, Whitney was wrong, but Whitney called him an ignorant, a, a, a sheepherder ignoramus. And so tried to make fun of, of Muir's right to speak and argue about a scientific case when actually Muir had him uh, whipped hands down when it came to how Yosemite Valley was formed. So Mount Whitney ought not to be Mount Whitney. It's a ridiculous name. And there's an, there might be a locatable Paiute name for it, which would be a very appropriate. But also a spur of Mount Whitney is called Mount Muir. So I recommended that we just flip those two names. They're about a mile apart from each other. You call Mount Whitney Mount Muir, you call Mount Muir Mount Whitney, and you've got the relative importance of the two guys suddenly marked out on the landscape. So these were the kind of games I was playing when suddenly it became serious business, where you don't want slave owners and racists having their names memorialized up in your range. And the process of taking them out and what you want to replace them with is Native American names when you can find them, or the names of heroic Americans who were um, discriminated against at the time where these names were coming about. So, in other words, people of color, African Americans, and women, um, they were systematically kept out of the uh, range in terms of names after them, and that could be rectified relatively simply. And a lot of names in the Sierras are simply foolish. A granite Pass, a Lake Basin. I mean, these are so simplistic and a little dim-witted. <laughs> uh, so there's games to be... There's there's things that can be done up there. There's no reason. There's no eternal rightness to the names up there. Many of the human names named after people are named after men who never had the slightest thought of the Sierras, never set foot in the Sierra. So um, why not name it after somebody more worthy? So yes, I I played this game quite considerably to the point that the last chapter about names is just a giant list of recommendations. And I still feel like I'm fooling around, but I don't want to um, diminish the... I don't want to... How can I say it? I don't want to uh, slight the emotions of the people for whom it isn't just fooling around, that it's important business in their own landscape. So uh, I've had to rethink, even as I've been writing this book, uh, new um, thoughts about the issue have been coming to me. Right. I think it's a game to rename Granite Pass because it's a very nonspecific and any of them could be Granite Passes, um, but a little more serious yeah. to remove some of the guys who are just actual outspoken racists. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, I, I think it's such a good point to me that, you know, the, the guys who were around from, I don't know, 1850 to 1930, like there's nothing about them that should give them sort of the permanent naming privileges to last for all time, um, and give them the final say. Yeah, for sure. Particularly since that was the moment of settler colonialism, that was um, imperial and often genocidal. So um, that isn't the right crowd to be naming our landscape for good and all. Mm -hmm. I think a, I don't know, we're, so we're recording this one day after um, a draft Supreme Court opinion uh, was leaked um, that if and when it becomes official, would overturn Roe v. Wade and the right to abortion. Um, and I, there's obviously much to say, um, and maybe we're not the ones to say it, at least right now, but uh, the one of the justifications for this is that some of the justices are sort of claiming to be beholden to the original intent of the founders who wrote the Constitution, or at least the ones who wrote certain amendments. Um, and, you know, obviously the problems aren't the same, but I end up kind of with a similar question, like, why do these dead white guys from hundreds of years ago get the final say in what the world we live in looks like? Um, and I wanted to bring this up with you uh, because one of my favorite sequences in your books, um, maybe in any book, is in the Mars trilogy. I think it's in Green Mars. Um, and they, they write a new Martian constitution. Um, and it's just this very exciting process of, like, figuring out what we would actually want our 
society and politics and economics to look like. Um, do you see any hope for, for something like that, for, for reinvention of the way we do things? Well, it's a good question. I worry there used to be amendments to the Constitution, and now the bar for getting an amendment to the Constitution passed seems too high. Um, I think two-thirds of the state legislatures, and, and it, it happened, I forget how many uh, amendments there are. I mean, there were 10 immediately, so how many have there been since then? I think we're up to 26. I don't know for sure the real number, but it used to be that the nation could come together on things and say, yes, we make this amendment. Now, in the um, partisan fracturing of the body politic in America is... Uh, so a 50-50 that I don't think there's anything that two-thirds of the state legislatures would agree upon. So we're stuck with what we've got. Now, um, it doesn't, there's, it's absurd to claim that there's anything in the Constitution that would uh, support banning abortion. Uh, it's not uh, in, that. that's where people begin to uh, twist and play with the Constitution and claim to be originalists when they're actually radical innovators. It's a rhetorical game to try to persuade people of the force of the rightness of their argument when they really don't have much else to stand on. And an ugly power move in this case, I can see a Congress legislating a right to abortion that the Supreme Court would then um, have to bow down to. I can see Congress legislating that the Supreme Court would do like uh, FDR's team tried to do in the 30s and say, well, look, we're going to um, make the Supreme Court be 15 people and we're going to legislate that they, um, uh, well, I guess it would take an amendment to take away their lifetime. But you, it do, I don't think it's called out <clears throat> how many there are to be in the Constitution. So in other words, you do get back into the ugly politics of, of working against... Um, uh, uh, constitutions are, on the one hand, if you actually live by them, you have rule of law, you have something to look at, argue over, there's a good aspect to constitutions, and you see that in the post-1989 constitutions. They can be put up there and, and then ignored by a police state that, that claims that it, it lives by the constitution and doesn't. Or they can be blockages to progress that is needed so that they're an attempt to freeze a power, a power relationship. They're just one of the games, one of the, one of the fields of battle, uh, the discursive battle, the political battle. Um, I don't, I don't, I no longer have strong feelings for or against constitutions per se, but I appreciate what you said about Green Mars, because in Blue Mars also they do another constitutional congress, and it's interesting to talk about these matters. If you were, if you had an open slate, what would you write now? And then in The Martians, a short story collection that goes along with um, the Mars trilogy, I actually wrote the Martian constitution out in full. It's basically a short story in the form of a utopian short story in the form of a constitution, but I had to study the new South African constitution, the new Eastern European constitution, the Swiss, the Californian, and the American. And these are the ones I looked at in some detail, trying to figure out what would I want for Mars. And you might ask, and I think it's appropriate to ask, well, how was I different from the, what did I do that was different from the pre-existing ones? I did what you see now in Ecuador and some other countries. I gave rights to the land that human lawyers would then defend. I had a, one big body of the legislature drawn by jur like jury duty, by lottery. An ordinary citizen is suddenly assigned to be a legislator for um, a certain number of years and then uh, rotated out and somebody else comes into power so that you didn't have uh, professional politicians or, or automatically a party system that split things up. And um, I forget what else I did, to tell you the honest, but I was really seriously thinking about it for, um, I would suppose it took me about four months to write what is in effect a 10-page short story. Wow. Yeah, I, you you mentioned that as a utopian story of sorts. Um, you That one's set on Mars, but you also have some books set here on Earth uh, in which 
laws are radically rewritten for the better. Um, I'm thinking of Pacific Edge, which is oh yeah uh, one of my favorites, and and then more recently, uh, the Ministry for the Future. Um, but in both of those cases, uh, the movement toward a better world uh, it happens, but it comes after things get really bad. Um, in Ministry for the Future, you open with this horrific, deadly heat wave in India. Um, and I think it's worth noting that as we record this, um, India and Pakistan are going through a horrible heat wave, um, maybe not quite as intense as the one in the book, but it's already starting to come true and will only get worse in the short term. Um, do you, I don't know, as um, you've been writing about climate change for decades, as it actually becomes uh, visible, the effects, um, do you think that's going to get people to to respond more and faster? Um, will things actually get worse before they get better? Do are you impressed with you know the progress you've made since you started paying attention? Or uh, yeah, where are you at? Um, the good the good in it is that it's now on the table as one of the major topics of civilization today is can we decarbonize fast enough can we deal with climate change it's an existential danger the ipcc is putting out warnings um the possibility that we could break certain planetary boundaries and release the the carbon and methane in the permafrost and melt all the ice on the planet and therefore drown all the coastlines and essentially crash civilization in a mass extinction event it's on the table and nobody I, I think that even the people who pretend to deny it are not really denying it. They are playing a political game and um, being contrarians. And the moment that they get scared for their lives, they run to the very same scientists that they claim they don't believe when it comes to the planet. But they're a minority. The world is aware that this is a big problem, and that's new, because when I was writing about climate change, even back in Antarctica, which I wrote, say, in 97 or so, 96, um, it was a topic that science fiction writers might talk about, or maybe James Hansen, or it was, um, an, an, it had not been put on the table of civilization as the major problem that it is now acknowledged to be. So... The progress has been a little slower than you would want, um, uh, but it it's progress. It's happened, and now we've left ourselves a vanishingly small amount of time to cope before things get dire, but even that is generally regarded to be true because of these IPCC reports. Now, what I I guess what I would say is that all kinds of good things are happening. And here's another thing to add. Private capital, which is really trillions of dollars of potential human work, investment money that pays for humans to do stuff, uh, is poised to make green investments and to try to decarbonize fast because a lot of um, asset managers, as they call it, which you could also say rich people, but also the people whose job it is to take care of rich people's money. In there's a these two are tightly tied together. They're all aware that they can't go on in their wonderful lives if the biosphere falls apart and society falls apart underneath them. There's very few of them that are so delusional that they think that they could buy a private island or go to Mars or do something that would escape the general collapse. Most of them are quite aware that um, they don't need to be as rich as they are to live a life of perfect luxury and security. And also, they need the society and the biosphere to keep going in good health for them to stay privileged. So an enormous amount of private capital is now looking for green investments. And that I mean, I, I say this as an old leftist and I'm basically a government over business kind of guy. And I think government needs to guide, kick ass, set boundaries, uh, set guardrails, um, force the action, um, demand the, uh, these investments. But also, I think that there's the, these in, 
this private capital is not going to have to be dragged kicking and screaming. It's not going to have to be nationalized. It's ready to rip. And so the projects, um, it's a matter of linking up that amount of money with those good projects fast enough to get the work done fast. And there's a underlying problem that I everybody is aware of. I won't go on too long about it. This whole civilization runs on the burning of fossil fuels, and it's very hard to decarbonize fast and still keep things going forward in terms of bringing people out of poverty, in terms of the electricity that everybody depends on. Um, it's it's uh, damned hard to uh, shift out of fossil fuels to something else, to, to clean energy as fast as we need to. So there's an extra push needed from governments, from uh, society at large, from citizens uh, pushing their governments and from private capital seeing that they better lead or else they're going to be uh, torn to shreds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you mentioned that a lot of private capital um, is not going to be uh, or won't require kicking and screaming dragon to to invest in clean energy um, but those uh, there are those you know fossil fuel companies for instance that are much more um, I guess stubborn and sticking to their uh, sticking to their guns and in your books there's a lot of different ways that people try to change the world from technological innovations to mass protests to creative economic schemes to writing a new constitution as we mentioned um but there's also a lot of sabotage property destruction uh what the powers that be would would term eco-terrorism as well uh -huh. uh, how this like this is in a lot of your books what 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 about it makes it so intriguing for you to write about well, it's a quandary. So you, you, right at the start, you put your finger on the problem. A whole lot of political power has been bought by fossil fuel interests. And what the people might want and what is good for the biosphere is not really what the uh, legislatures are legislating because they've been bought by fossil fuels. And because in order to be in office at all, they need to have the money to bankroll themselves. Speaking of bad Supreme Court decisions, uh, Citizen United equating money and free speech has meant that um, um, some people have a lot more free speech than others because they're richer. And so we are in an oligarchy of sorts. And some members of the oligarchy are, are thinking short term and thinking, I don't care what people say, I'm going to hang on to what I want, which is my privileges and my money. And, and damn, damn the, the future. Um, that's not my concern. This is not the attitude of good parents or grandparents, but these people, money is a big distorter of mentality. It, once you get enough money, the Midas effect comes into play and everything turns to gold around you and, and you become paranoid and, and, and really somewhat stupid. Um, this is clear in the record. So uh, I've written about people uh, resisting that you can't just um, march into the gas ovens. You can't just agree to this stuff. And if the political process stops working because the political process has been bought, then you need to resist. Well, okay, civil disobedience is uh, step one and perhaps the most effective. Um, the book Civil Resistance, uh, How It Works by Erica Chenoweth is very good on this. Bill McKibben, uh, head of 350.org, is very good on this. And of course, this goes back to Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Thoreau. Just uh, You, you just uh, refuse to agree to a system that's wrecking the world. And if enough people did that, it would change. So this is the thing to point to first, and that's a dramatic story to tell when you're writing stories, uh, novels about mass action and social change. The moment of revolution is when you can get out of the bureaucracies and the board and the meeting rooms and the laboratories and you can have things happen. So there's a narrative urge and, and people in their ordinary lives feel a narrative urge like, damn it, I'd like to see something happen rather than just vote and watch TV. I'd like to do something. So mass action is important. In Ministry for the Future, I definitely uh, turned the dial 
and I postulated that there were going to be people in this world very soon, very angry, radicalized to the point of um, rage when they see their village destroyed, when they see their families die, they are going to want not just justice, but revenge. And at that point, it doesn't matter that the violence they do will rebound on their heads or won't get the new government that they want. They want revenge. And there will be a crazy disorderliness. And uh, that could happen. We could be coming into a period like that if we don't respond fast enough and if um, a lot of people begin to suffer the sharp end of climate change and see a lot of their people die, there's going to be radical resistance. And then you might see eco-terrorism. I'm not sure that that... I don't think anybody should want that. I don't think that's the best way to have change. What we should do is fear it in advance. Tell the story to each other. Uh, a friend of mine, a, a teacher of mine at Glasgow, said to me, you don't have to be in a plane crash to know that you don't want to be in a plane crash. And so the story of the world falling apart is in one sense, uh, to, I wrote ministry partly to say, let's not do it this way. Let's see how bad and messy that would be and do it a better way that doesn't involve the violence. So... Um, it's a sort of thought experiment. It's not a utopian novel, like if you just do everything in ministry, things will be all right. There's there's a multiple deaths. There's disastrously bad decisions. There's all kinds of things go wrong in ministry for the future. Uh, because I feel like we're not going to have an orderly transition. And, and, and basically, I feel like that story needed to be told to wake people up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh... For this podcast, for uh, for Patreon subscribers, um, we have a, a book club, and we are going to be discussing Ministry for the Future in in two months, so in in late July. Uh, oh, good. I'll I'll make sure the date is in the episode description. Um, so yeah, I, I do want to um, just have a couple more questions about the High Sierra book as well. Um, okay. One of the one of the names you want to change is uh, the Sierra's tallest peak, Mount Whitney, um, to Mount Muir, uh, and I think John Muir was was very much a uh, an important figure in um, keeping parts of the the High Sierra protected. Um, but there is also uh, some controversy around John Muir now uh, within the Sierra Club and and outside. Um, so I was wondering if I could sort of get your your thoughts on that. Yes, yes, I would be happy to speak on that. I feel that um, he has been maligned, and uh, um, it's a wrong to accuse him of being a racist. It's factually wrong. Um, to to say that with a certainty, because uh, it was an instinctive feeling. I've read all of John Muir's published work, and I've read a huge tranche of his unpublished work, which is at his archives at University of Pacific down in Stockton, California, and a lot of that is now online. I've read all the secondary literature. I've read all the biographies, uh, his letters, etc. And I, I marked all these books at looking for evidence one way or the other. And what I've concluded is that um, he wasn't perfect, but he was awfully good. There are uh, probably a dozen sentences in his entire published work that are kind of cringeworthy. And it, it needs to be remembered that he was brought up uh, on a farm, uneducated, a Scot amongst other Scots, even in Wisconsin. Um, and he is an autodidact who educated himself, but also under the lash of an abusive father who made him work six days a week from dawn till uh, dusk and didn't allow him to read after dinner. So he began to get up at 1 a.m. before he went to work in the morning to uh, read. That was allowed. And he was beaten a lot by his dad through his childhood and youth. And from the ages of 11 to 22, he was basically like a don live the life of a donkey he was a human donkey whipped by his father put to work on a farm and um, um, 
uh, a life that he resented intensely while it happened. It's not appropriate to say that he lived the life of a slave, but he was indeed a slave to his father's wishes and was like what you might call an indentured servant. And it, that left marks on him so that if he ever saw anybody sitting around in the middle of the day, he would have a kind of flash of anger. If he ever saw people in dirty clothes, he would have a flash of disgust. And he traveled widely in the American West and through California. He spent a lot more time with, he went, he had this one, the thousand mile walk to the Gulf. He walked through the South right after the Civil War and saw a lot of recently freed African American slaves. Um, and his comments on them were completely various from amazement to admiration to disgust, depending on what he saw. It is all individual and it was a new thing to him. And it was a, the mixed response of a young ignorant man who was writing down what he thought that day and a lot of it was filled with admiration so i don't think that any charge of racism like these confederate slave owners could ever be leveled against muir then when it comes to native americans well he went up and he lived with the tlingit people for three months he knows a whole lot more than native americans than these than his critics do and in his writing he was 95 percent positive and every once in a while he would see the the bedraggled post-genocidal california native americans and and he would write it's amazing how dirty they are or uh, various kinds of ignorant and and cringeworthy sentences those have been pulled out of context put onto the internet and he was claimed to be a racist and then in an act of of astonishing hmm, foolishness the executive director of the sierra club um after george floyd was murdered um and in the that summer of 2020 he seemed to feel that the sierra club had to go to their donor class and say look we're not a racist organization um we apologize for everything we did we apologize for john muir <clears throat> it was an unnecessary like an unforced error he had no reason to apologize for John Muir. John Muir didn't need apologies. Um, he was a, a, a pro-Native American. He defended their rights. He argued with a cavalry officer over a dinner table. This was reported by a third party. So a wonderful piece of evidence if you're trying to grasp John Muir's personal opinions, where Muir just blew up a dinner party yelling at a cavalry officer for his brutal policy of Indian extermination. So Muir <clears throat> uh, is innocent and a heroic figure. And so the Sierra Club executive director, um, he made that statement. A lot of people protested at it, including me. Um, the internet doesn't know what to think. It just is clickbait and oh my God and uh, virtue signaling and various kinds of behavior of of, of uh, jumping on various bandwagons in a kind of a Twitter phenomenon that isn't uh, has nothing to do with historical accuracy, and it was a little shocking and dismaying how quickly his reputation could be thrashed, like within a couple of weeks. Um, but the defense of him has been strong and smart and grounded and persistent, and indeed recently um, members of the Sierra Club. Uh, African-American man, Aaron Mayer, and an African-American woman, Marianne Nelson, got together with a, a forester named Chad Hansen, and they wrote an essay defending John Muir, and the Sierra Club wouldn't allow them to publish it in Sierra Club magazine, even though they were defending the founder of the club. They published it somewhere else, got censured by the Sierra Club board, and the executive director resigned the next day. And then they ran as petition candidates for the board in the Sierra Club. And I don't even want to go into the details of that um, horrible fight, but I'm glad that there are people fighting for John Muir's reputation and for the soul of the Sierra Club. Two of the four petition candidates won. The, the pendulum will continue to swing because the evidence is in John Muir's favor. And so I'm happy to, I, I mean, I was thinking I would have to throw myself out there and defend him. Now I'm thinking it's not just up to me. Um, the, the evidence speaks for itself. His writing speaks for itself. Um, he wasn't a racist and that view will, that balanced view will come back into play. 
Um, he's not an angel. He wrote some sentences that are um, regrettable and shows him as being um, a little ignorant of the historical reality of, of the genocide of the Native Americans, but not totally ignorant of it, because when he saw the Tlingit, a culture, a Native American culture that was less damaged than the rest of them, lived with them for three months in Alaska, came back down to California, and he said, oh my gosh, uh, now what I realize is, and at this point it was 20 years after he'd arrived in California, I was seeing a, a devastated culture rather than uh, a, a, tip, a degraded culture that always lived that way. Uh, and he hadn't fully gotten it until late in his life. But all the changes are there in the record. So um, Muir will survive this this momentary blip of insanity on the part of American culture and on the part of the Sierra Club board of directors. Yeah, I think, you know, if, if anyone goes out there and, and reads um, some of the things that he did write about certain uh, Native cultures, it it will, like, it will sound bad, uh, but that where where i was kind of convinced by your argument is if, like if you think he's judgmental about the native uh, people wait till you hear what he wrote about some of the white people yes yes he was a sharp-tongued guy um he hated miners loggers sheep herders um yeah he was kind of puritanical you know he had that scottish bent in him he was brought up by a weirdo calvinist he was and he was very hard man himself hard on himself so and sharp tongued and sharp tempered, so but you not a saint. No, uh, no way. Not a saint. You mentioned that dinner party though as sort of an example of uh, you know if it came to it between the the settlers and the indigenous inhabitants, uh, he was going to speak up for the against the settlers and, and for the indigenous inhabitants. Um, yeah, I think one. Uh, yeah, maybe one one quick thing to to talk about could be that there there was an indigenous um, presence uh, in in the Sierras. Uh, you you've been on hikes where you you find obsidian. Um, I wonder if you could sort of talk about the significance of of that. Yes, yes, it's a lovely thing, um, striking and evocative. It's now pretty clear that Native Americans um, crossed the Sierras and have been crossing the Sierras for maybe 10,000 years. And and given the way dates keep, keep getting pushed back, I would push them back even further, but 10,000 years ago, the High Sierra was heavily glaciated, so it wasn't the same landscape as it is now. But from about 5,000 years, it was the landscape that we see up there now. The clue is that obsidian, uh, black volcan volcanic glass, is found only on the east side of the Sierras, not in the mountains themselves, but down below in the Owens Valley. There's Obsidian Dome, which is like a more than a lifetime supply. In other words, like, I don't know, 50,000 years worth of Obsidian arrowheads in one dome on the volcanic material very near Mammoth. Um, and so when you find it in the High Sierra, it's never endemic. There's no native uh, endemic obsidian in the High Sierra. When you see it up there, humans brought it, and they were napping uh, arrowheads and other sharp tools. And the cool thing is there are places in the High Sierra where there are thousands and thousands of pieces of, of chips of, of black glass to the point where the hillsides just sparkle. In the late afternoon, you look to the west, and it's like Big Rock Candy Mountain. The The whole hillside was sparking with light. And we didn't understand what we were seeing. We wandered over to check it out. What what are these brilliant flashes, like mirror flashes out of the ground? And we saw black glass everywhere. It, it seemed as if it had to be centuries of sitting there making arrowheads. There was so much black glass. And so I talked to a state archaeologist who specialized in the Sierra, uh, and he said, yep, yep, that was a napping site. Um, I think 5,000 years at least, maybe 10 of inhabitation. And he said they summered up there, and then because it was super hot down in the Owens Valley and down in the Central Valley. So in the summer, they would go up to the high meadows. They would party. You have clear signs that 
um, Native American tribes from the west and the east would meet up there and mingle. There are seashells in the Owens Valley. There's obsidian out on the coast. The languages are mutually comprehensible. They're dialects of the same language family. These were cousins, and they summered in the High Sierra. And I have stood and spent a day wandering in one of those high meadows that was clearly one of their summer villages. And when you're talking about nomads, um, nomadic people that moved with the seasons, these were one of their homes. So there, one of their homes was up in Taboose Pass in a meadow that is at about maybe 11,000 feet above sea level. So it would have been great in the summer. And it's still great there in the summer. And there is black glass all over that meadow. And also of some clearings. Looks like maybe the space that you would make. You see teepee rings all over the American West in the Rockies. And what this looks like is the Sierra equivalent of a teepee ring where a lot of round stones are around an oval space that's been cleared like it was a floor. So they would make a... Um, a home out of local materials and then the next uh, spring they would probably make it again with fresh materials They'd get out of the summer thunderstorms and have a place to sleep at night a quite um moving a beautiful beautiful experience to think about that long long sierra life uh, summertime only and and ponder what it must have been like and think about um, what we can learn from them, how indigeneity, if we are as settler colonials um, and we can't reel back the clock, we can't do, uh, we can do reparations, but we can't uh, restore the past. But it seems to me the more aware of what happened, uh, the more aware you are of what it was like, and the more time you spend up there wandering around on foot, like they wandered around on foot, in other words, is a kind of postmodern uh, reproduction of the Paleolithic that is is not uh, authentic, uh, but it is similar. Um, this is a good thing to do. It teaches you life lessons all across the board, and um, it, and again, this is a late thing for me. <clears throat> I backpacked in the Sierras for decades without even knowing what obsidian meant up there. This was a discovery from, say, about 2002. So it's a, a 21st century evolution of my own Sierra thinking and my own Sierra experiences. And it's added a huge amount of uh, depth and uh, emotional intensity to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe the last thing uh, we should talk about is... Uh, the idea of wilderness, I think a lot of people maybe think of it as human free space. Um, as you point out, the High Sierra, uh, you know, hasn't been totally human free, at least in summer for thousands of years. Um, yep. But that there, yeah, I, I mean, it's somewhere that you clearly enjoy spending a lot of time. Um, you're, you know, I, <laughs> maybe even a little... Uh, scornful in the book of certain more touristy spots like Yosemite that are crowded. And it's clear that one of the things you value about the High Sierra is some level of solitude, at least relatively. Um, but then, but then also you want more people to go out there. Uh, and so I guess just, we touched on this earlier with um, the half earth of, of just sort of that it doesn't necessarily need to be totally free of, of humans, but what is, what is a, a concept of wilderness that appeals to you and is worthy of defense and redemption? Um, it has become a contested term, but mostly amongst, um, in the universities, amongst academics who are splitting hairs and finding new ways to be right and cast the past as wrong finding flaws with the idea of wilderness exactly when we need wilderness more than ever in the 30 by 30 and half earth plans to save the wild creatures. We need to get out of their face and give them space of their own to pursue their own lives in because we're bad for them. Um, now, but the thing is that all of these are quickly shift into arguments that are focused too much on purity. Um, an empty landscape that a human wanders through once in a while 
can still be wilderness or usefully empty so that the other animals can get by okay in it. And a lot of the places where you can't farm were always that way. And also there's an interesting argument being made by my friend Tobias Mendeley and some others that even indigenous people in the Paleolithic had parts of the world where they didn't go or didn't go except on sacred quests so that there would be space for animals to prosper. So the concept of wilderness is not just a 19th century category error of purity and of kicking poor Native Americans out of their spaces in order to make something uh, even more pure and better. That That's the attack on wilderness, but it's a kind of a straw man argument. Um, first you make wilderness into a cliche of itself, then you attack that. It's a um, waste of everybody's time. In fact, we need to leave a lot of the landscape alone for the wild creatures, and we can get by in the cities and in the ag areas that we're revolutionizing into regenerative agriculture, and then leave a lot of the planet to the animals. They'll they'll recover, they'll prosper, we'll have a healthy biosphere because of it. We'll be healthier when they're healthier. So wilderness is easy to defend because it's a critical component in dodging the mass extinction event. And and so I, I don't even want to spend too much time refuting a few, um, you know, office-bound uh, academics who are making a reputation by attacking this straw man vision of wilderness. There are um, organizations, uh, scientific organizations, that have split up land management uses in, into about 40 categories um, in order to get us through this next century with as as intact a biosphere as we can. Those are the people to listen to and focus on and not get too hung up on arguments about purity or about definitions or about um, academic disciplines of fighting over turf. I mean, all that is a, um, it's a waste of time. They should probably go backpacking and think it over. <laughs> and you, you point out in the book that indigenous people were a lot of the land from which they were removed is, is not, Wilderness land is, is land where lots of people live now. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. so one more, uh, one more for you. If, if I or someone listening want to go take a few day backpacking trip in the high Sierra this summer, uh, where, where should we start? It's a good question. And the sweet thing is, uh, almost anywhere will be, equally fine. Um, I have my own preferences and I will express them for you and, and make a suggestion. Depending on what you feel your physical capabilities are and how used you are to altitude, um, one can, if if you want a, a kind of pocket Southern Sierra, go to the Desolation Wilderness uh, southwest of Tahoe, as we did in our first decade of intense Sierra life. It's smaller, it's lower, it's still gorgeous as can be. It's bare granite and it has all the aspects of the High Sierra, even though it's more compact. And especially if you've got kids, the desolation wilderness is like perfect because they don't get exhausted by the, the big distances further south. And they have the experience that is um, scaled to their own uh, physical childhood. So with children, desolation is perfect. If you're adults, and, and really I would say that if you pack light, if you keep your gear load down so that you don't overburden yourself and try to keep your backpack to 10% of your body weight um, right from the start so that you aren't feeling like a donkey up there, um, especially if you're young or if you're at all active, you're going to be fine because it's just walking. Well, then what I would recommend is the east side of the Sierra, anywhere between Lone Pine and up to Mammoth, a little south of Mammoth, um, head west, up into the trailhead, almost any trailhead from um, Horseshoe Meadow in the far south, just south of Lone Pine, all the way up to 
um, for me, McGee Pass, which is just south of Mammoth, any one of those trailheads, head on up and over the crest of the range and wander around, and it's going to be fine. They'll, they're, I have uh, some favorites. I have some that are, uh, I call them the four bad passes because you start so low on Owens Valley and you've got to trek over the crest and the crest is so high so that you can rate the trailheads by how high, high they are. And if you've got a trailhead that you're starting at at 9,000 feet and you have to go over 12,000, that's not so bad. If you have a trailhead that's at 5,000 feet and you have to go over 12,000, that's going to be painful. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, you might attend to that, and then it'll be yours because you will have chosen it. And that might become your favorite forever. Yeah, I, there are uh, lots lots more on routes and packing and gear in the book. Um, yep. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's a good way to end. Uh, uh, give it a try. I, oh, I Here's what I'm guessing. Uh, from my own experiences, not everybody's going to like it, but if you're up there with a couple of friends and you spend two or three nights out, I would say like spend three nights out to, uh, uh, as a first attempt to see how you like it. And I would guess that it's not even 50-50. About a third or a quarter of the people doing it will say, oh my gosh, this is really fun. This I like this. I'm going to do this again. And the rest of the people are going to say, well, I mean, geez, I don't really get it. It's kind of hard work. It's kind of uncomfortable. It was good to talk to my friends. It was good to see the sunset, but it's, you know, it's not for me. So, um, and that's true of reading novels too. Uh, uh, I think only about a quarter of the population reads novels and it gets the same thrill out of them that I do. So that's okay. Everybody has their own ways of having fun, and I don't insist on mine. I just think that young people in particular that haven't, and young Californians, if they haven't tried the Sierra, and if they do try it and it and they like it, like like Sierra lovers like it, because there is a type there. There were people who devote their lives to this, getting up to the Sierras as much as they possibly can. There are thousands of them. There aren't hundreds of thousands of them, but there are thousands of them. And for that crowd, it becomes one of the fundamental joys of your life. You even structure a lot of your life around a chance to get up there. And you don't want to let that take over your life. Uh, it tends to wreck some lives. But um, if you can keep a balance, it will be a permanent joy in your life that you're not going to get out of any th other aspect of life. And it will be a, 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 not, a not a crutch, but a, a support in hard times, um, a thing to look forward to, a thing to remember with joy. Um, we're too urban. We're too screen-oriented. We're too in our heads and not in our bodies. And all of those things can be really mitigated by having a Sierra life. Well. Wow. Thanks so much. This was Kim Stanley Robinson. The book is The High Sierra, A Love Story. Um, hope to run into you in the mountains someday, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. That was Kim Stanley Robinson, author of The High Sierra, A Love Story. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, please consider sharing with others who might enjoy it. Um, and yeah, if you are intrigued uh, by Stan... Uh, please consider joining the Storytelling Animals Book Club. Uh, on July 26th, we will be discussing the ministry for the future. You can keep up to date with the podcast and uh, the book club at my free weekly newsletter. The sign-up link is in the episode description. And I've also included some links uh, about John Muir and the controversy in the Sierra Club. Um, obviously, Stan did a lot of research um, and came to a pretty strong conclusion about that. I'm sympathetic to that conclusion. I think there is a lot that is admirable in Muir's legacy, uh, but I also don't want to dismiss out of hand uh, the grievances people have, some of which at least I think are legitimate to at least be discussed. Um, so I've included uh, links in the episode description to some articles both praising and um, critiquing Muir uh, for you to get a sense of that conversation.
Some of the other issues uh, Stan brought up, such as uh, E.O. Wilson's Half-Earth and The Rights of Nature, are actually issues that we've discussed on this podcast in the past, so I've included some links to that as well. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for listening. Uh, please like, subscribe, uh, rate, etc. Follow this podcast and me on social media. I'm Dayton Martindale, and hope you have a good day. Thank you.